welcome. Let's begin. Uh, yes, Sue Scott, thank you. Greetings from Renee. Lovely to have you here, Renee. <laughs> okay, let's get going. Um, welcome. Thank you for investing your time. Thank you for investing your energy and joining us today in our conversation about something that is so hugely important, which is childhood trauma and how to deal with it. Um, hello, I'm Judith Richards. I'm the creator of the Richards Trauma Process, or TRTP. Let me introduce the panel and have them tell you a little bit about themselves as well. Um, Paula Zalkberg is a family therapist. Um, Paula uh, has specialised for a number of years working with the deaf community, a lot of deaf children. So she brings a, an interesting point of view to this work. And um, Paula's in Melbourne. Paula, is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, not really, just that I guess I've had experience. I was a teacher of the deaf for many years before I was working as a counsellor and family therapist and work a lot with other disabilities as well as um, autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. Which, which brings its own trauma. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Paula. And lovely Warwick McClellan. Warwick's a clinical psychologist uh, in private practice in Coffs Harbour in New South Wales. And Warwick's known for his fabulous work with children uh, in that community. Um, Warwick, anything more that you would like to add to your background? Um, yeah, well, I started out working in child and adolescent mental health and, and with um, yeah, sorry, started with children and, and adolescents. And um, yeah, that was my, my training ground and, and uh, it's, it's you know, placed me in good stead to work in private practice with this with this population, but certainly, uh, yeah, since I've done the TRTP training with Judith and picked up a few new tools um, to work with kids, I've certainly you know, taken my work in a bit of a different direction and, um, yeah, it's getting some more powerful results since incorporating some of the stuff, but I'm sure we'll get onto that soon, Judith. I'm sure we will, Warwick. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, and thank you for the attendees here telling us who you are. That is great. We know who we're talking to now. Uh, childhood trauma, it's such a huge arena. Um, what types of childhood trauma do each of you deal with, Paula and Warwick? Um, I'll just start with Paula. What are the main areas that you deal with with childhood trauma, Paula? Well, I guess the main areas generally is separation and divorce of parents. Ah, uh, ah. Yeah. this is a huge area, isn't it? And often I'm asked to see the kids of parents who are separating and divorced. Mm -hmm. um, as I work with a lot of kids with other disabilities as well, the disability itself is the trauma, Not even if the kids have not been bullied per se. Mm -hmm. um, their perception of it, of it is a trauma for themselves. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I, I guess they're the main areas. Other sorts of things as well in terms of self-esteem, bullying, you know, being bullied constantly, teasing kids who have had to move school many times because of bullying, um, again, comes back to their belief about their unconscious core beliefs about themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And we'll get into unconscious core beliefs. And someone has raised their hand. I'm really sorry. I can't help you if you raise your hand. If you have a question, as we go along, for any attendee, if you have a question, just type it in and we'll, we'll answer you as part of our conversation. So just join in, ask your questions, make your comments. Uh, we'd love to have your interaction. Um, bullying. Is, I mean, there are kids topping themselves because of bullying, on online bullying, in the schoolyard bullying. Um, it's a, a massive issue. And can I say, not only bullying from other kids, but often I've had kids who feel that teachers haven't supported them and have bullied them. Oh, so yeah. that's Ooh, yeah. 
So it's not only, it's the system, it's the school system, it's the um, teachers, it could be a principal, it could be anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are some, some schools are actually pretty destructive, aren't they? We could go into that, but we, <laughs> we probably won't on this call. Um, you know, I've come across kids who um, they've got a new principal at the school and the principal wants the, the school to go up the ratings because they'll get more funding. And so they go out to get rid of the kids who are non-performers and they bully them into leaving. Uh, you know, especially kids with um, ADHD and issues like that. And I've had kids who've been cornered by principals and deputy principals and just yelled at and screamed at till they have a meltdown. Ah, oh, there we go. You got to go. It, it's cruel. Not that that happens in all schools. I mean, some schools are fabulous. But some kids, what they go through at school is um, pretty big. Yeah, and I've had kids who have been to five, six, seven different schools in a short period of time and they just That's keep moving schools stuck in flight mm. looking for a safe haven mm. it's not a lot to ask for is it within the education system i'm glad they've got you paula and what about you warwick what sort of um trauma are you mainly dealing well, with i agree that i'm seeing a lot of kids that are affected by parent separation and some of that is because one of the parents are particularly abusive. Um, I won't say, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a balance of both. I would say I'm seeing a fair bit where the father is, is, is the abusive parent, but yeah, still seeing a fair, a fair percentage where the, where the mother is. So I, I think a lot of verbal abuse is what I would see the most, most commonly as trauma, but yeah, bullying's pretty close there as well. Um, and uh, you'll get, I agree with everything that Paula said as far as the effects of, of separation. Um, some sexual abuse, obviously, being a clinical psychologist, I get the, the pointy end of the spectrum. Um, so, yeah, I get, I get a bit of it all in my, in my line of work. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's, and what I have found, and probably <laughs> you'd probably back me up on this, work is that a kid doesn't just go to school and all of a sudden become the victim of bullying, that there's stuff before school that has set them up to um, be in that place. Do you have oh, any definitely. comments yeah. on that? Yes, it doesn't sure. just happen out of the blue. No, no. Yeah, well, and I think you've got a couple of different categories of that and Paula touched on it a little bit, I think, with, um, yeah, kids who are a bit odd. So you've got the, the spectrum kids who... Um, maybe um, yeah, don't, don't quite fit in and draw that attention in negatively. And that's just how they're bi biologically wide. But I think you're alluding to Judith, um, the kids who have had, you know, lack of nurturing, um, made them feel like they're not good enough or inferior uh, inadequate within their own families. So that yeah. they, and that then gets projected into the way they um, engage with their peers. Yeah and draw that negative attention. Yeah. So on, on that point, um, in terms of how kids are set up to be bullied, if we could just go into um, what happened, and I'll just quickly run through, probably everybody here understands, but for those who don't, it's worth going over anyway, um, that even before we're born, we're taking on ideas of who we are and if we're safe, our place in the world, and then we're born, and for some people, that's a life-threatening event in itself. Uh, and then we go into a family situation, and things happen. We take on ideas, sometimes from an adult in authority who says things, like the grade one teacher who says we're stupid and we'll never get a job, uh, and sometimes our little person's perception of what's going on. And, of course, a little person is egocentric. You know, we see their little drawings and they're in the middle and there's dad and mum and the dog and the cat and the sibling and they're in the middle. And so they take on this idea often, not always, but often they take on the idea that everything that's happening within the family that's negative uh, is their fault because they're the centre of their universe. And they can take on ideas, you know, up until the time of about seven or eight, we take on ideas that become our core unconscious beliefs, our unconscious core beliefs. It's like we get 
It's like that becomes the hardware in the computer and that runs the computer, which is our life. And uh, if we take on negative ideas of, and the biggest one, of course, is I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And another one that little people can take on very easily is I'm a terrible person. I deserve to be treated badly because everything's my fault basically, and I'm going to swear here, sorry, I'm shit and I deserve to be treated like shit, I don't matter, I don't belong, I deserve to be punished, I deserve to suffer. And when we take on these ideas when we're little, then we go into primary school <laughs> and we've got, that's running in the unconscious all the time and we become a victim of bullying, etc. as we go through our lives. Uh, so that's a really important point and it's important to, to turn those unconscious core beliefs into the positive, which we do very, very quickly with uh, TRTP. Paula, you were talking earlier before we came online um, about that importance of I'm not good enough, that, that idea that kids take on when they're little. Yeah, I think that a lot of the kids that we see, probably Warwick too, that that's the core belief, I'm not good enough for whatever reason. <clears throat> and that plays out in everything that they do, and especially kids who are on the spectrum or have got ADHD, they quickly realise that they're a little bit different because they get to school and all of a sudden they're getting into trouble for stuff that they thought was okay, and they're told to sit down and they're told that they're disrupting the class and they're told all these things and they start to think, what's wrong with me? I'm not good enough. And that plays out in every part of their life. And every time they have another uh, incident where that plays out, it just cements into them, yep, I'm right, I'm not good enough. Yeah, yeah, and that goes on to be, I'll never be good enough. Mm. No matter how hard I try, and for some poor kids it becomes, there's no point trying. What, what have you found, Warwick, in that department? Sorry, I was thinking about the response to the question that came up on the screen. Okay, we can we, can we, no, okay no, Kate no, Mooney, yeah. the question here. Hi, Warwick. How were you trained to or working with unconscious core beliefs prior to studying TRTP? And were you getting oh. results with that? No, well, that, that's quick. I, I, it's a quick answer. I was just distracted by it because it saw my name come up on the screen. So, no, I wasn't trained in it at all. That's the short answer. Judith uh, was the first person introduced me to yeah to, to work around the subconscious uh prior to that i'd been trained in the pretty standard sort of psychology modalities of cbt and act and and all the all the the ones that um yeah generally focus on the conscious mind so yeah that's the short answer to that question but i can go back to the other if you'd like to repeat the other question Jude, if i can uh, you know, how's your practice well. different now oh Okay, how's my practice different now? Were you, were you getting uh, results then? And what, how's that compared to now? And how is your practice different now? Yeah, well, I think now I'm, I'm feeling that I've got tools that I can um, really address these underlying traumas and these beliefs both with, with children before... Um, you know, if I go from, say, a point of view of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is the main model that I practice from um, prior to TRTP, um, teaching children how to not listen to their thoughts or not believe their negative thoughts, you know, diffusion, we call that in acceptance and commitment therapy, or uh, be present and come back and anchor themselves in the moment when they start to get caught up by those ideas or, or those, those difficult feelings. But as far as addressing the trauma itself, really, I, I, I wasn't armed with anything that could, could really, you know, address that well. So, um, yeah, so having options now to um, use a child's imagination, uh, get them to stand up and powerfully, you know, say from that from their gut some statements that can um, resonate at a deeper level in the subconscious. We may talk about that further soon, Judith. I'm, I don't yeah. want to jump the gun. Um, no, you go for it, Warwick. Yeah. Wherever you want to take this, you take yeah, it. Sure. Um, so, well, yeah, that, that's one of the techniques that Judith um, that teaches within TRTP. It's it's called the I Choose technique it's it is born out of a part of the trtp process that um 
that involves the changing of subconscious beliefs using a particular phrasing. Um, I choose to know, and there's a real power in that statement, just choosing something different for the self, not having to necessarily fully feel it or believe it first, but just powerfully choosing it. And um, with emotion, with emotion. And that's, yeah, that's the key to this technique that, that to doing it with kids is that you have to, and then, and that, that can be a little bit of a challenge with some of them to want to really buy in and tap into that emotion. But I think if you lay some groundwork and engage with them and connect with them, you can yeah definitely get them to do it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty straightforward technique. It involves focusing on a point I'm now using. I used to have blue tack now, but a red pin that I stick in the wall. Um, and that's the, and that's <laughs> their focus. Fine. Yeah, there you go. And it's red, Judith. You know, it's a special colour in CRTP, as you know. Um, and yeah, so that is stare at that spot and I just teach them how to stand powerfully beforehand, zoom in with their eyes locked in on that spot until their mind just blanks out. I talk a bit a bit beforehand about how the mind, the conscious mind kind of quietens down when you're just staring, when you go into a blank stare and, um, and they do that and then they just repeat the phrasing that I feed them around the I choose stuff. And, um, Could yeah. you give us an example of some of that I choose stuff? Um, okay. Okay, so we've got a notes. kid that thinks that they're never going to be good enough and they deserve shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just, it's just the opposite of that. I string a whole series of phrases. Um, uh, so so that there'll be a cluster of statements that start with, I choose. So I choose to know that I don't deserve. And yeah, look, I think swearing, saying the word shit, like you said, Judith, with kids, depending on what age you're working with, I think it, it, um, it works. Maybe the slightly older, you know, childhood stuff, not the real young ones, maybe, but the, um, the ones around the 10, 11, 12, that, that'd be, I think. They tend to get okay. a bit more into it. Do if it. you throw yeah. in a swear, swear word, word, don't word. they? Right. Have you found that Paula? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I don't deserve to be treated like shit. And there's a power in saying that rather than I think we've spoken about this in TRTP before rather than saying I deserve to be treated with respect. Yep, that sounds nice. And that would still be one of the phrases that I, I would potentially use. But I think, yeah, something I don't deserve to be treated like shit and I, because I am good enough. And I deserve good thing. You know, it just it has a power in it when you, um, when you speak that way. So, yeah, so that, 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 that's a sort of phrasing. And I, I probably... <laughs> would go with oh it varies but there's at least you know seven or eight statements maybe more that um that i'd run them through in that exercise while i've got them engaging the exercise and, it, it, and I, they usually would revolve around one one two or maybe three themes i don't try to just cram everything into that if we need to do the exercise again another time that's fine but um yeah look some of the results are pretty impressive one kid that i did that with um, so for example, he was a kid on the spectrum a couple of years ago and we just did the I choose technique and it was, um, for when he would get upset and this is not so much, well, I guess it's sort of trauma if you call bullying or, or being affected by peer dynamics trauma, then Definitely. I guess we could call it that. Um, but <laughs> he would, he would lose it at, if, if someone cheated in a game. Okay. So he'd absolutely lose it in the playground. And look, I can't remember exactly what's something, but it was something along, along the lines of I choose to know I can control my I control myself when I when things don't go right. I choose to accept that people won't always play fair, that sort of thing. And um, he came back. I think he didn't. I think he didn't have an appointment book for a little while. So I think it was about a month later, and his mum came back and said the teacher was almost in tears because she couldn't believe how this kid went from losing it every time someone cheated to. Um, just being able to walk away and go, okay, uh, that's he's annoyed by it, but he's able to manage it. He's not was, going off. Yeah, so that was really cool to what a change that, those sorts that of results. Kid. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So I mean, and you can get yeah, those sorts of results are possible with all matter of children. Yeah, and so, it doesn't take long. No, it's very exciting that it can be over such a short over yeah, with such a short exercise and not necessarily have to repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Susan Scott saying, how long would a session with a child go for? How long do you take, Paula? Uh, just, I do a normal one hour session with a kid. Doesn't matter if it's a kid or an adult. Some, and, but a lot of the time I do have the parents in there. When I'm working with kids, I actually work with the parents too. Just going back, 
with the unconscious core beliefs with what Warwick was talking about as well, is from session one, I go straight... The wonderful thing about TRTP is that from session one, I go straight in to the unconscious core beliefs. And what's incredible is that the same unconscious core beliefs keep coming up and they're usually I'm not good enough or it's not safe or um, I deserve to be treated like shit. And when and you say they keep coming back up, do you mean for the for that child they keep coming up again no, and again and again? I think or do you it's mean the across same, clients? Across, across clients, it doesn't matter what the issues, they're pretty much the standard unconscious core beliefs. And I think that working with them doing the I choose statements, as Warwick says, is incredibly powerful from word go. And also I have got a lovely example of a young boy who for the first two sessions, just cried for the whole hour and oh, couldn't hardly speak. And every time he did speak, I could hardly hear what he was saying. So I got him up. How old was this boy? 12. So Poor again, little guy. Yep. Stand up, put your energy down. I choose to know that I matter. And as Warwick said, give him, you know, five or six. And then, and why? Because I'm fucking awesome. And all of a sudden he belted out, I'm fucking awesome. And his voice <laughs> came out of him. And then each time he got a bit teary after that. And I said, and why do you have the power to change that? And he goes, because I'm fucking awesome. <laughs> and he just cut up. And now when he comes to my session, uh, and then the father came to pick him up after that session, and he was jumping around, smiling and jumping out of my room. And the father goes, what'd you do to him? <laughs> and yeah. I said, oh, just a few I choose statements. <laughs> yeah. And so the result from that has been amazing in terms of the strength in his voice. He very rarely cries in my sessions now. And even when Isn't he does... Marvelous? He can recover from that. I get him up. I choose to know that I have the power, that I can do this. And we do a few I choose statements. Bang, again. Why? Because I'm fucking awesome. <laughs> so that was... And that, isn't that marvellous? That boy's life so has changed. So the power of that is quite profound. And it's such a simple, simple thing to do. Yep. And like I said, from word go, from the first session... Straight, I don't muck Straight around. In. Before in my practice, I would wait, I would talk, do a lot of talking and figuring out what was going on. Now, straight up, I can say, right, this is what's going on. You believe this. Oh, and okay. that's where it all comes from. Yeah. And the kid, one, I have one kid that goes, can you read my mind? Do you know what's in my head? <laughs> and I said, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. And just answering Jan Mc Jan's question here. So there's nothing wrong with phrasing in the negative, unlike the positive affirmation crowd. Jan, let's just talk about this for a second. Um, and if it's all right, I'll, um, I'll answer this one. Yeah, with the I chooses. Jan, if you're a person who's been deeply suffering because you've, you're, you believe you're shit and you deserve to be treated like shit. And, of course, what happens is people, it's like you've got a big neon sign on your head saying, treat me like shit. And so wherever you go, at school or wherever, that's what happens because that's how it works. And if you say to that person who's in pain, stand there and say, I choose to know I deserve to be treated with respect, nothing's going to happen. Because we have to tap into our deepest depths. So tap into the pain. Tap into the emotion. I choose to know I am not shit. I have people sometimes screaming. I'm not shit. I was never shit. I don't deserve to be treated like shit. I never did. I never will. And then we tack on. You know what? I deserve to be treated with care and with respect. Why? Because I matter. I choose to know that I matter. I have value and that I choose to know. It's not just an affirmation. This is why affirmations don't work. Warwick, why, why is it that affirmations don't work very well? What do you reckon? Because the person feels a, a clash between the words that they're saying this and, and, and what, how they're actually feeling at the time. So and that they're trying to convince themselves. Whereas the, well, anyway, the I choose is, is not about, like I said before, having to feel it. 
feel it's 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 a it's a just a choice it's a straight up choice about where you're going and what you now want yeah yeah it's yeah. a it's a conscious decision if i choose to be well i know i need to be knowing this and it's i choose to know it's not i choose to feel as you just said i choose to know that and um it, with an affirmation, what happens is you say, okay, I deserve to be treated with respect. And immediately the unconscious goes, you're dreaming. That's not true. So you get the immediate pushback from the unconscious. But I choose to know that it's just a conscious choice. It's, there's no pushback. So it, it and said with absolute guts and, and emotion, it, it shifts things. Um, Paula, do you have anything to say about that? No, I, I, I think that's right. I think the, the I choose just standing up with the energy down creates power, creates the feeling, the feeling that you want to believe. You may not believe it yet. You don't need to believe it yet. You just need to be able to say it. To and, choose. That's and what to I choose, choose to believe. To believe. I don't believe that, it yet. No, but I choose to know. And even I choose to know that it's possible to know this. Yeah. And, and in our society, it's, well, if I know I've had people say, but I can't say that because I don't feel it. Mm. That, well, what did I ask you to do? Did I ask you to feel it? I choose to know it. The feeling will come, but in our society, we have the feeling first and then I'll know it. So it's, um, it's, it's the, the choice first and then the feeling will come. Um, what um, Warwick is talking about in dropping and Paula talking about in dropping the energy, it's, it's something that we do in TRTP. Um, that's not just singular to TRTP, but, you know, we're taught to go out into the world like a soldier, you know, at an intention. But physically we're actually a pushover because if you stand <coughs> at attention, it's very easy for someone to push your chest and knock you off your centre of gravity. You have to put a foot out behind you or you'll go splat back. And what we do is we drop our energy we relax our legs and drop the energy into the thighs and you can push someone and they're a rock. So that's what we do. Um, and from that space and saying it from our guts, it shifts everything. And with some kids, that's all they need with some kids. Uh, I had a client who uh, a little boy, 11 years old, who had a huge trauma. His mum dropped him, he and his brother off at his dad's place. The door was open. She assumed that dad was in there and she drove off because she was running late to work. And the boys went in. There was no furniture. And they went upstairs to their room. All the furniture was gone, but their toys and books were smashed to pieces. And dad wasn't there and it was getting dark and they didn't have a phone. And they were very traumatised by that. And all we did is I choose to know that dad leaving had nothing to do with me. That's dad's shit. <laughs> sure, I got mine, but that's dad's. It had nothing to do with me. I choose to know that mum's going to be home at the end of the day because this boy would run home whenever there was a break at school and he was social phobic. And uh, within just doing the I chooses, within a week he was running assemblies at school and, and he'd become a school leader. So it, it's, it can be quite powerful. Um, any more comments on that before we move on, Paula or Warwick? No, and, and there's something here from Kate Mooney. I've just done some EMDR training recently. I talk about how hard it is, how hard it is to get the right statement that activates the trauma neural network that links to the trauma you're wanting to deal with, as you are speaking of. They talk, teach about this taking time and potentially many sessions to get the statement with the energy you speak of. You're saying you can get to these phrases really quickly. How are you able to do that? Is that something you teach in the technique training? Yeah. It's just freaking obvious the way we... Oh, sorry. Kate, it's very... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's very obvious and we do it straight up within the first half hour. Sometimes within the first 20 minutes, sometimes within the first 10 minutes, what we do is we connect heart to heart, soul to soul. I teach that. And then we just, we just, we're going in. And that's what we do. And you get, 
some people, even with adults, you get some people going to, you know, convulsive things. Some people uh, sob, but it just, we get straight to the heart of it and we change the unconscious like that. Um, is that something you teach in the technique training? Yes, absolutely. And I'll be doing a workshop on this in capital cities across Australia um, in the next 10 days. Melbourne is on Saturday the 2nd at Melbourne University. Sydney is Sunday the 3rd. Brisbane is Saturday the 9th. Adelaide is Sunday the 10th and Perth is Tuesday the 12th and I will be teaching anyone who attends that workshop and they'll, they'll, you'll leave the workshop knowing exactly what to do, how to do this like that and no matter what modality you use, you will have better results because you'll have the unconscious and the conscious in sync. So let's talk about that conscious and unconscious. Here's a, a very detailed infographic that I just produced. <laughs> Okay, if we think of this as the mind and the conscious mind is active 10% of the day. The rest of the time we're driven by the unconscious and the programs in there. It makes sense, doesn't it? Change these unconscious programs and the whole of life changes. Instead of focusing on the conscious mind, it's not doesn't happen in the conscious mind. Trauma is not stored in the conscious mind. These programs, this hard drive that runs the computer of our life is not stored in the conscious mind. The conscious mind is like the keyboard. But you have to have the right programs in the hardware. <laughs> so we change that and everything changes. Um, so um, there's another question here. I'm just having a look, just excuse me for a moment while I read that. How do you suggest the child thinks badly of them? How do you suggest the child thinks badly of himself? It's just really obvious, Lynn. I think that's the answer. Have been choosing the choose for some and I'm now. Who's that? Donna Maria. Hoping to do TRTP in February. Great. Okay, Donna Maria, and for anyone in capital cities who'd like to join us in these uh, workshops. Um, Judith. Yeah. Judith, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the, the list of subcon or the, 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 the most common subconscious okay. beliefs. We've touched on a couple of them already. Warwick, would you that, like that to do that? Before. Warwick, <laughs> okay. off you go. Um, well, I, well, I was curious about um, hearing a little bit from you too, Judith, because in the um in the training you give us a list of some of the more common unconscious core beliefs to look for and um when we're well with it's with adults it's looking at their homework to to figure out what unconscious core beliefs to target in in trtp with kids i guess i don't know about you paula but it's yeah, doing a little bit of history taking and information from the from the parents and that sort of thing would be the the way to inform with unconscious core beliefs to look for. So I think maybe the question earlier might have been also asking, you know, what, you know, about that phrasing, which ones to look for. But, I, but you know, I think from my experience, yeah, those un, there, are, there are common ones. They don't have to be the exact, I don't know if the phrasing has to be perfect, but the... Yeah that it sums up the general feeling for what the, what the belief is. So, you know, I don't deserve to be treated like shit or I don't deserve to be treated like crap or, you know, it doesn't matter whether the person uses crap or shit. That doesn't really matter. Like they, there's still the same vibe of being treated poorly. And um, yeah. So I, I don't know if the wording, the exact wording as the earlier. It doesn't matter. It's the, it's the, as they said, it the, matters that much. It's the vibe. Yeah. It's the vibe, it's, it's the Marbo, vibe. it's, sorry, I'm going into the castle, which is my favourite movie, but it's the vibe. And and what, what Warwick's talking about there, uh, what are the one, main ones that you use, Paul, that you find are across the board with most of your kids? Again, um, and one of the questions there was, how do I get straight into, how do I get straight into that? You know, usually, like Warwick said, you do, I work a lot with the parents and the child, not just the child on its own. Um, mm. depending on the age. So I, 
you know, as a family therapist, I work basically with the parent. And a lot of these, it's very, when you take the history, sometimes it comes very clear why the child has these beliefs. So you can pick that up quite easily, um, I think. And then going on um, to answer that question, how do I, because there is basically a theme of um, common ones, like I'm not good enough, it's very easy that the, the kids are brought to you because there's some sort of issue uh, mm. with the child. Often it's a behavioural issue. And then yep. my first question in my head is, why is that kid behaving the way he is? Yeah. And I get the parents to answer that. Why do you think that child? I'm like, what do you mean why? We're just dealing with that problem. He's always got throwing tantrums. Why is he throwing tantrums? And that goes back to your subconscious core beliefs of, oh, I can't regulate. Something's happening. I don't feel safe. I've got to throw a tantrum. And so then I do a bit of the history taking and work very heavily with the parents because often I find that it's actually the parents' stuff that comes out onto the child. And often um, after a few sessions working with the child, I will then work with the parents um, and often do TRTP with the parents because they start to realise that it's actually their own stuff that is stopping them from being the sort of parents they want to be. And it's actually not the child. And I had a beautiful example of a mother who came in with her son with ADHD and, you know, he talked over her the whole time, kept talking, kept talking. How old was this boy? Uh, eight. Mm -hmm. um, and she was talking to me as well as talking to the kid and he was asking a question. And then all of a sudden I've got this lovely sand timer that I turned over and I said to him, now, while I put this sand timer on, we're going to watch the sand come down. Let's watch it. You're not going to speak and I'm going to speak to mummy. How about that? You can, you can play with the Lego, you can draw. I gave him different things to do. Well, for 20 minutes, he didn't open his mouth. And the mother turned around to me and said, I just realised something. And I said, and what's that? She said, this therapy is for me, not for my kid, isn't it? <laughs> I said, you got it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so yep. That's, yeah. that's a big one. Yeah, thank you, Paula. And we talk in TRTP about the pond. Um, Bruce Lipton, um, many people here would um, be familiar with Bruce Lipton's work. Bruce Lipton back in the 70s when he was doing proper science got an award for discovering um, that our cells have only two switches, shut down survival or thriving and growing. There's nothing in between. And it's the environment that triggers. There are environmental triggers, triggers that cause the shutdown with all energy going into just existing, just sustaining life or thriving and growing. Um, and so... The environment shuts us down or gets us growing and thriving. We talk about you can take a sick fish out of a sick pond, clean it up, put it in a lovely clean plot pond, and that little fish will thrive and grow. Take a sick fish out of a sick pond, clean it up, put it back in the sick pond, it'll get sick again. So many families are the sick pond. So it makes sense then, doesn't it, to work with the parents to create a clean pond for that little fish so that that little fish will thrive and grow. And, yes, yeah, some people are saying um, parents, adults don't feel that they're good enough. No. So this works across the board from children up to adults. Um, uh, anything else here? See how to fit with more? Let's see how to fit more clarity. Yeah, often looks like and feels like a war zone. Yes, Steve, some, some houses are not homes. They, they are war zones. Mm. Uh, and the, the biggest demographic for PTSD in our society is domestic violence. But um, what is, here's a good question, Warwick. What's the most difficult thing about working with kids and trauma? Yeah, um, so I think, I think the most difficult thing is also the thing that sometimes can be the easiest. And I, I know um, Paul is maybe alluding to it as well as, as you, Judith, that, um, you know, when you can really connect with a kid and, and just speak to them like a, like a human being and not like they're any less than you. And obviously as therapists, we're trained to be able to really do that sort of thing. If we're working with kids, we, we should be anyway, otherwise we're not going to get very far. But 
I think the biggest challenge is the whole kids coming, you know, against their will type of element. So that that getting that buy in for me is in just with some of them, it's it's not as simple as just being enthusiastic, connecting with them, being cool, whatever. And and some of them are just so, you know, you know, uh, just just not buying into. Okay, I'm going to stand up and say this out loud. So that that. It would be the would be the biggest challenge that some kids that do that and then that, that different angles you've got to take to get them to buy in because yeah. unlike adults who come to therapy and say I want to be here I, I, I need to work on some things a, a kid isn't coming so or well most of the time they're not they're yeah. not they have made the choice a lot of them will realize when they get here that this isn't a nice person I'm in front of and and someone um, is here to help and can help and, and all that sort of thing but yeah I yeah, think that's that's probably the number one challenge for me. I don't know about uh, you, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Can I just butt in there, uh, Warwick? How I yeah, you go. Because, Sorry, you go, Judith. Yeah, um, how I get around that with kids is I do this little acting out thing where they stand in front of me and I have my hands cupped, <laughs> and I said, "This is the responsibility for your life." And they might be ten years old or twelve years old. So put out your hands. <laughs> Who owns this? Who owns this life? Is it mum? Is it dad? Is it me? Getting them to say, well, it's mine. Say, okay, put out your hands. That's your life. Where you go, your life. You might be 10 or 12. It's your life, darling. It's your life. And you get to choose. And then getting them to stand up and say, I choose life. I choose, no, I deserve a good life. But getting them to take that responsibility, um, there's not enough time to go further into detail, but to say, darling, darling, this is your life forever. What are you going to do with that? Do you have a 100%? Do you have 100% success on that, Judith? Because I do throw, I do use that, my version of that. That yeah. and I don't have hundred percent success with that. So maybe I, there's something I, your, I don't know. Your I way. don't know. But just connecting that heart to heart. So and it's yours, mm. darling. And maybe I don't know, maybe it's a mm. feminine thing, Warwick. I think that yeah. it just depends on how shut down kids are. And like Warwick, I agree with you, Warwick, that there are some kids that no matter what are incredibly shut down. And usually they're older kids, uh, but not uh, always and uh, not but uh, not always. But, you know, I've worked with kids for a year that have said nothing to me except, oh, no, oh, no. <gasps> oh, um, that's And it's really hard work. Um, but I would say that 80% of the time that's not the case, that most of the time mm. there is a way of connecting with a kid. Um, but... Mm. Of course, there are, there, there are some kids who I've worked with, you know, usually teenagers who are incredibly shut down and um, that's the difficult work. And mm. the question you asked before, Judith, was what's the most difficult thing? And it's actually often not the kids. It's actually getting the parents to realise yeah. that they're the issue and to take that on board. And I find it's actually not working with the kids that's challenging so much as working with the parents to get them to to understand that yeah yeah that's a, that's a good point and, and some kids uh don't want to engage in whatever therapy you're doing no matter what the therapy because they're angry at the parents and they're punishing them absolutely and so naming that um can be helpful you know this is and, what and happens the, sometimes yeah and the, and the toxic pond that it's actually not safe to change. Ah, ah. And, so, and so that can be often one too, that if I do ah. get well, then what happens? So I think that sometimes the unconscious core belief behind some of these kids who are very shut down. Yeah, yeah. Is it safe to be well? Mm. And, and, and that's what in those I choose statements right at the beginning, I choose. And what we do, here's another big infographic. <laughs> okay it's drawn beautifully is we do this t 
And at one end, we say not well, and at the other end, we say well, or with the kid, happy, unhappy. What do you choose, darling? Where, which end do you want to choose? And hopefully they'll say happy. <laughs> okay, and who's responsible? We do this with adults as well. Who's responsible for getting you there? For, with older kids, with teenagers, I use fucked and fan-fucking-tastic. What's your choice? I do this with adults as well. Do you want to be fucked or fan-fucking-tastic? It's your choice, darling. It's your life. I want to be fan-fucking-tastic. Okay, who is responsible for getting you there? Some will say, well, it's you. Say, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not my life. Uh, and so that can be really, really helpful. Um, and uh, he's a... Uh, Judith Tobin, how have I managed to survive parent abuse that happened over 50 years ago? I've reared two beautiful children and never abused them. Well, many of us who've been abused don't go on to be abusers. So good on you, Judith, rearing two beautiful children. Um, Don Marie, this is a question that I gather is a no-brainer. Judith, Paula and Warwick, how does TRTP work with narcissistic parents, siblings at our just dealt with that? Is it safe story myself, Paula? Thank you for that. I think that maybe that is playing out elsewhere in our home. Shall I look at that? Thank you. How well? Can I say that often it's not both parents who are narcissistic. Often I find it's one parent um, who's narcissistic and who thinks therapists are stupid and have got nothing to say and it's all a waste of time. And that was basically the case with the girl who only said, I don't know, the father just like the yeah. therapists are idiots. Um, so what I would, what I work with then is what have I got to work with? I've got the other parent and the child to work with and I work on that, building right. that, building that relationship. Sorry. $50 fine, Paula. <laughs> that's okay. Sorry. Yeah. So that's a good point. What about you, Warwick? Do you have anything to say about that when there's a narcissist parent? No, oh, oh, look. I think it's um, yeah. I think what Paula said is pretty valid. I, you know, obviously a narcissistic personality is um, not looking at themselves at all, so they're not going to be presenting to do TRTP for themselves, unlikely to anyway. Or if they are, no. their motivations might be not Yippee. right, and they're not going to get the results. So um, yeah, so I think I think it's it's, it's a challenging one there, and, and that's where as therapists uh, we can be a little bit stuck at times in really affecting the change that we know um, we'd like to affect while the, while the fish pond remains very murky and, yes. and they're in that situation. Yeah. Yes. And so as Paula says, doing what is, can be done with the other parent. And it's interesting that um, dynamics within families change when you get one or two changing. But that's a whole other arena which we won't go into. Um, uh, Tanya, I find parents that do circle of security course really see results. Have you used course of security at all in partnership with TRTP? It also uses hands and parent insight into how children respond to parent behaviour and engagement. I think TRTP sounds amazing. Tanya, the short answer is no. We don't do circle of security. What we do is we change the unconscious core beliefs and we take the emotional charge out of the past. Uh, so some, so that the person goes from that space of I'm not safe to it's over and I'm safe now. And that's what we do, mm. whether it's with children or with adults. But certainly with children, there is the family element. Um, yeah, and TRTP is amazing. We do get... Um, rather extraordinary mm. results. And just on that point, just before we... But you, ta, Warwick, you were going to say something? I might, can, can I make a comment on that, though? Sure. Um, yeah, I was just going to add to that. Look, I, I think something like Circle of Security after T -R -T -R -T -P could be you know, hugely valuable because if, parent, yeah, if, if parents haven't learned how to form that um, secure attachment or haven't le learned their skills to their own poor attachment experiences and of course that's great but I, I agree with what Judith says if you uh, do, dealing with the unconscious core beliefs and, and getting that parent to a point where they have really released their their stuff and, and are a bit of a 
bit of a reset and and cannot be triggered off by the child or um, mm. you know uh, in a much more centered stable place then obviously circle security coming after that or it might not be needed because it just becomes a bit more intuitive that they can connect a bond with their child after yeah that and and I think that's a really good point Warwick that you just mentioned there about when the parent is no longer triggered by the child yeah then there's this so if we work with the parents work with the child get rid of those triggers so that that's not happening all the time so there's a calm space a clean pond at that point there's lots of room for learning actually how to parent for learning how to do relationship for learning all those life skills that some of us miss out on along the way but what's happened is there's no triggering. There is a receptive, safe family that can go ahead and learn uh, because, you know, we need to learn these things. Um, Paula, just a second. I'm unmuting oh, you. Yes, there. Sorry. About that. Yeah, and, putting a pro and being able to put appropriate boundaries around their kids. And often that's what parents can't do when they're triggered by their child's behaviours. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes, that's very good. We, we'll, we're just about to end up just very, very quickly in one sentence, Paula. When do you not have the parent sit in the room with the child? Um, when they're young, I like to have them there. Often I will do half, I would do 45 minutes with the child and have the parent come in for the last 15 minutes. And as they get older, um, I mix it up because I think it's very important for the parents to hear the sort of language that I'm using with the kid and to be able to model that for the parents. So I just mix it up, really. Okay, thank you for that. And we're just about the end of our time. We could go on for hours. We could go into such depth um, with all of this. And I, I've so enjoyed this conversation with you, Paula, and with you, Warwick. Um, Donna Marie says, okay, I should do all I can to make the Brisbane session on 10th November booked elsewhere. However, believe this is really important. Yes, it is important. Donna Marie, I look forward to seeing you there. Um, Catherine, uh, thank you, Judith, Paul and Warwick. Great information. Looking forward to the workshop. Yes, come to the workshop, people. And the workshop will give you everything about just what we're talking about here. How to change. How do you find out what are the unconscious core beliefs? What are they? I mean, they're unconscious. We're not conscious of what goes on in the unconscious. How do you find them out and how do you move them to the positive? So by the end of the workshop, you'll have practiced it, you'll know it, and no matter what you're doing, you'll get better results because you'll have the, the conscious mind, which is that 10%, in sync with the big guy, which is the unconscious. And when that happens, ooh, it's... Uh, is pretty powerful. Um, in terms of the, the workshop, please come to the workshop. There's still room to time to book. If this, if you're finding this compelling within you, come to the workshop. If you're not able to do that, make an appointment to have a conversation with us. If you're compelled to have extraordinary results because, you know, I've just been just near here recently. There was a fabulous big conference um, run by fearless.org.au, which is about PTSD, bringing together all the PTSD groups in the country, having a conversation. But unfortunately, all of the conversation around that, around trauma, not necessarily just PTSD, but around trauma is about how do you manage the symptoms? Well, why the hell would you just manage the symptoms when it's possible to resolve the whole darn thing? That's what TRTP does. That's what we do. We're not about management of symptoms. We're about resolving, bringing a person through, taking them by the hand, taking them to the other side of their pain so they're no longer triggered. And with little children and bigger kids, I mean, it changes the entire trajectory of their life. People do not need to be in so much pain and we have to do something different. TRTP is not just a new process. It's a revolution. We have within our community 
uh, of practitioners, academics who are getting the research underway to prove this process. Uh, we are taking this to the world and our end point is to change how mental health is done so that people are not just managed. So within a few sessions, they're right to go. I say to a new client, why would we just return you to normal when this is your opportunity to create freaking extraordinary? Are you up for that? Because that's what we do. So this is transformative, this work. If this calls you, because we have to do something else, our communities there are kids topping themselves because of bullying. We can fix that. We can change that. There are adults. I mean, the highest cause of death in 14 to 44-year-olds is suicide in Australia. I mean, what is that? People are being turned away from emergency services, you know, in A&E. We have to do something that works, that's fast, effective, and doesn't re-traumatise. TRTP doesn't re-traumatise. So if you are called by this, come and join us. Let's change the world just because we freaking can. Let's take away the pain. If that interests you, go to the website, the richestraumaprocess.com and click on a 20-minute Q&A. Give us a call, have a conversation, see if we're a match. It's not for everybody. But let's talk. And if you're coming to the workshop, please come and introduce yourself to me. Uh, at the workshop, there'll also be a, a, a really interesting, very substantial discount for the training because more people need our help. Come and join us. Thank you, Paula, so much. Thank you, Warwick. It's always a joy Thank you. to... Uh, talk with you. My life is so fabulous. Uh, I get to talk with, I'm surrounded by TRTP practitioners of, of the same high caliber and heart and, and brilliant intelligence as, as Paula and Warwick. So thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, yes, Laura, it should be in schools. We will get to that. <laughs> Come and help us, Laura, to take it into schools. Let's change kids. You can do this in a big group with kids. You can change the whole trajectory of their life. Come and help us, Laura. Let's <laughs> do this. Okay. Thank you, everyone.